Have you ever had a goal or a dream, personal or professional, that was so big and so gnarly and so complex that the idea of speaking it out loud literally made you get a knot in your stomach? That voice in your head that says, that dream's too big for you, that's too complicated. Maybe you have an idea that would disrupt your entire profession, you know, or the team that you work on, uh, go against the status quo, but you're thinking, I don't want to be the gal that rocks the boat. And so you keep that idea or that dream inside. I think we've all been there. I told you just recently, I, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yes, there are people from Las Vegas, Nevada. Plan A, I was too short to be a showgirl, so I went with plan B, I became a fighter pilot, okay? <laughs> but in Las Vegas, there's an Air Force base called Nellis Air Force Base. It's known as home of the fighter pilots. So I grew up watching these fighter jets fly overhead all the time as a kid. It's also home to the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. So in high school, I'd take my brown bag lunch out, eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and my Fritos, and overhead would come these Thunderbirds screaming by with their smoke trail on, and I thought, I want to do that someday. But I knew that it was hard to become a fighter pilot, and even harder to become a Thunderbird pilot. In, uh, for a little bit of context, in your American active duty Air Force today, there's about 12,000 pilots. Of those, about 3,000 are fighter pilots, and of those, only six, only six on any given year have a chance to be a Thunderbird. It's statistically improbable that anybody becomes a Thunderbird pilot, but it's not impossible. And I had harbored this dream since I was a kid. And what's interesting is in the Air Force, every year they send out the same email at the same time that says the exact same thing. We're looking for three new Thunderbird pilots. Here's the qualifications. Here's the application. It's a two-year assignment. Three pilots are new and three pilots are experienced on their second year. And every year, even though I harbored that dream, I would do the exact same thing when that email came into my inbox. Ding. Delete. 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 Other people become Thunderbird pilots, Nicole, not you. And year after year, even though I was qualified, I deleted that message. And then finally, in 2005, I found myself at the height of my experience and skill sets, the height of my career, flying that beautiful F-15 E Strike Eagle I showed you earlier. I had every single certification and qualification. I was leading peers safely in and out of combat in Iraq, and ding, into my inbox came the same email. And for whatever reason that year, the like, light bulb came on as I read it. And I finally thought to myself, why not me? Why not me? And I tossed and I turned all night long and finally in the morning with just enough courage, I walked into work and I spoke my lifelong dream out loud. I told my peers and my colleagues, my supervisors, my chain of command, I'm applying to be a Thunderbird. Man, it was hard to do. That voice in my head thinking, what if they all laugh at you? And I remember as the days went by, people were generally supportive. But then if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, you know, Nicole, it's hard to be a Thunderbird. You know, Nicole, you probably won't get picked. You know, Nicole, they've never had a woman Thunderbird pilot before. Are you sure you want to do that? Over and over and over and more that voice of self-doubt grew in my head. But I stayed focused. I said, okay, I'm going to do this. What's it going to hurt? So I put this application together, which was like very gnarly and complex, as you might imagine. It was a picture of me in uniform, a letter of why I wanted to be a Thunderbird, all of my annual HR performance personnel reports, all of my annual flying test or flying check ride scores from across my career. But the thing that was weighted the most, the thing that had the most like, you know, sway in this application was a letter of recommendation from the first full bird colonel in your chain of command. Now, I'm a young captain up here, 30 years old. A full bird colonel was a big deal. It was intimidating. Now, I am a retired full bird colonel. We're not a big deal. We're a dime a dozen. But <laughs> at the time, right, I thought, well, if I just draft this letter for him, I'll just walk in, and all I need is his John Hancock. So I drafted the letter. I took that application, big application, walked it over to his staff, and with all the courage I could muster, I slid it across the desk. And I will never forget this moment. The guy looked right at me, and he said, you know, Nicole, it's hard to be a Thunderbird. You know, Nicole, you probably won't get picked. You know, Nicole, they've never had a woman Thunderbird pilot before. And the colonel only has one recommendation he's allowed to give. So we're not sure we want to waste it. Boom. I felt sucker punched. The wind came out of my sails, right? You can imagine how I felt in the moment. And in the truth of the matter is what I did is I reached across that desk. I grabbed the application and I removed it. And I said, you're right. I'm so sorry for having bothered you. And I walked out with my application feeling embarrassed and ashamed. Other people become Thunderbird pilots, Nicole, not you. What were you thinking? 
And I did what any self-respecting fighter pilot would do in that moment. I walked across the street to the officer's club and I may have grabbed an adult soda. <laughs> and I was sitting over there talking to the guys about flying, inside thinking, thank God I didn't risk failure. Thank God I didn't put myself out there. Thank goodness I didn't embarrass myself. And as I'm sitting there doing my thing, in walks the wing commander. Now, the wing commander is a general. This guy's six foot six, like the poster child of the, the macho male fighter pilot. He walks over to me and starts making small talk to this day. I have no idea why he talked to me or what we were talking about. But he's sitting there talking to me. I'm trying to be cool, looking way up at him. And over walks my immediate supervisor, a guy by the name of Dan Debris. His call sign is Trash. Okay, some of you got it. Dan Debris, call sign Trash. Okay, he said... General, General, did you know Nicole's applying to be a Thunderbird? <sighs> I'm thinking, ixnay on the Thunderbird day? This is terrifying because neither of them knew what had just transpired across the street and that I had removed my application and was no longer applying. And General, uh, he, General Mark Matthews, he looks down at me, like way down at me, and he goes, that's great, Nicole, how's your application going? <sighs> right, I can't believe this is happening. And I looked up at him way up and I said, you know, sir, it's hard to be a Thunderbird. You know, sir, I probably won't get picked. You know, sir, they haven't had a woman before, so I don't want to waste anybody's time. Everybody else's, right, expectations about what I should or shouldn't be doing. Everybody else's unconscious bias, the cultural paradigms of the Air Force at that time, had taken up room in my own head and were now coming out of my own mouth. True story. And I remember in that moment, General Mark Matthews gave me one of the single greatest gifts of my career. It's a set of words that I have used for every professional success I've had since then. And it's the one I'm hoping you all will remember when you get that knot in your stomach or your voice in that head that says, that dream's too big for you. What if you fail? Don't be different. I want you to remember this. He looked down at me and he squeezed my shoulder kind of hard, I think, to get me to shut up because I was just like making all these excuses. And he squeezed my shoulder, looked me right in the eye, and he said, Nicole, Nobody wants to lead a scripted life. Nobody wants to lead a scripted life. And he walked away and left me in silence. And with those words, he told me it was okay to dream big. He told me it was okay to risk failure. He told me it was okay to be different. And it wasn't so much that he was telling you and me to write ourselves into the script. What I believe he was saying is don't ever write yourself out of the script. And as teammates and friends and colleagues, don't ever write anybody else or their wild ideas out of the script either. People ask, did you ever get the letter of recommendation from the colonel? No, I did not. But I did get a letter of recommendation from a general. 